More than half of all companies globally are family-owned or operated. Family businesses contribute 70% of the world's GDP and account for 65% of jobs. Their voices are important. Their stories must be told. Brought to you by the award-winning publication, Tharavat Magazine. This is the Family Business Voice with your host, Ramya Elagami. Hometown. Visual earning in manufacturing. Hometown has been producing industrial cores and molds in Ohio since 1959. Just as it did to many other manufacturing businesses in the Midwest and around the world, the 2008 economic collapse brought disaster. Hometown went from more than 200 employees to a mere 17. Unbowed, Mark LaMancha of the second generation saw an opportunity to implement an idea he had long been considering. He knew that unlocking the human potential of his team members was the key to redefining Hometown's competitive advantage. So to heighten their engagement, he incentivized performance by converting the labor portion of the job to a visual earning rate in real time, engaging them in their task. For Hometown team members, a higher output translates to a higher earning rate, which is updated every cycle and displayed on a nearby screen. To add to this, Hometown uses gamification to foster a dynamic of positive competition. Prioritizing people has led to a wider transformation in Hometown's culture, of which the visual earning system is only a part. For example, there are no supervisors on the factory floor. Instead, there are performance coaches whose express purpose is to help workers and by extension the business perform better. The results are staggering. Hometown's productivity increased by 400% on the first job the system was installed on. We spoke to Mark LaMoncha to discuss the economic crisis as a catalyst for change, engaging team members in the digital age, and how people-oriented managerial practices transformed his family business. Enjoy this episode with Mark. Before we get into the you know the thick of things and everything, it's always sort of nice to understand. I, I would love to know a little bit more about you, Mark, and tell me a little bit more about like you know how come when you joined the business and like you know what your journey was like leading you to the position that you hold today in Hometown. The journey started when I was 12 years old, working on Saturdays and learning the company business under a mentorship program, and it was a pattern making business at that time. And then when it came time to graduate, as I went through high school, I actually ended up working more, but I really ended up not having the spatial perception to be a pattern maker. Mm -hmm. So I actually left the business for a few years and went into the service industry for about three years. And then I was asked to buy back in and start commercial sand core making to make metal cores and molds for pouring liquid metal into to make castings. And I started that when I was basically 19 years old. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I joined the ranks of the nearly 100 or 100 hours a week in growing the business rapidly, Mm -hmm. one expansion after another, until we ended up growing to the point where we hit the, the great wall of the Great Recession. Mm. in 2008 because we had grown to over 220 people and when we hit the the biggest wave it was dropping us down to 17 people with only three in production wow and i really had no choice that i didn't make the decision the decision got made for me by the economy because we were starting to do a lot of work for automotive and that's where you can really grow your numbers but just as rapidly you can shrink them. So how did that all play out for you? But so how did you, I mean, yeah, the decision was made for you by the economy, but then you had to still manage that and do that and sort of like, you know, lay off all these people. So how did you go through that phase? And like, how did you get out of it at the other end as well as as successful as you are today? During that time, I learned a lot about, you know, it wasn't about what we make or how we make it, but the why inside of the people. And I came across many larger corporations that some of which employed the servant leadership model Mm -hmm. where I'm coming to work for you. You're not coming to work for me. Mm -hmm. And I was at a point of 
of redefining myself, which I had done two prior mini recessions, but you know, this one being that drastically of a drop, it becomes a defining or a redefining moment in your life. Mm. Take all the all the arrays of things that you've been through that you bring together and including studying Lincoln Electric with their incentive plan, we had started a a type of an incentive plan right before this happened. Mm. So I was trying to find a way to move them out of pay rate jail into more of an earning system and something different than incentive because typically incentives basically employ the carrot and stick. You know, then the company will change the standard. Mm-hmm. And there's no fulfilling positive prophecy when you when you build that model. Mm-hmm. So I, I just asked myself the question, along with some divine intervention, you know, what would Lincoln have done if he would have had computers today? So I decided that I could talk to my corporate attorneys in Columbus and find out about building a real-time earning system. Mm-hmm. And basically what that does, it puts the earning rate of the team member on the screen as mm-hmm. they cycle the machine and allows them to construct based with skill and performance. And in real time, every time they cycle, it allows them to see the results of their work almost like a unofficial industrial engineer. Wow. We're such a latent reporting type of a, of a country instead of using real-time information you know, like the stock market. So Mm -hmm. once the attorneys approved it, I started the process with my team members in building the system and putting it on one machine. Mm -hmm. So um, MIT came shortly after we started emergency resourcing projects for Ford and for Chrysler. They had a lot of factories that got shut down that were going to shut down, you know, our vendors that shut down that were going to basically cripple their assembly lines. This was in 2008 already? Or oh, coming, was... Yeah, it was in the middle of the of this huge recession. That was like, yeah. Where, okay. Yeah, where GM and uh, Chrysler went bankrupt. We thought that if we could do things in a very agile, short period of time, which there were some really huge success stories. One was for Ford. This one was for Chrysler. We had it on the machine, and we were getting about four to 500 parts in an eight-hour period. Mm prior to putting the real-time earning system on it. And of course the volumes were low until the economy got better. As when we put it on, it was running at 70% of rate. They would have under the system been running at $7 an hour Mm. because the percentage corresponds to the rate of pay or the earning rate. Mm -hmm. So what happened was after we put this on, that particular job ran up to as high as 350 to 400 percent of rate and we went to six hours instead of eight hours Mm -hmm. we found that the defining point when people were performing at a higher level is six hours so Mm -hmm. now our company is restructured to work four six hour lines a day six days a week Mm -hmm. so it's basically a 36 hour week and then when you put this system on we basically ended up making 1,440 of these in a six-hour period when before we could only make 500, four to 500 in eight hours. So what happened was basically 26 industrial athletes, which is another model that we're building into this, were able to put out 140% more work than 152 workers. Wow. So... Just explain this to me. So these systems that you put into place, like these were there before the recession or these were there as a consequence? This this was a consequence basically of what you faced due to the downsizing. So I I have a question for you with regards to culture, because like, you know, you were talking and we'll talk a little bit more about how this impacted, like how you had to adjust in terms of leadership. But how did people respond to these things? And did the culture of the company change? And also... I'm assuming you've hired new people again in the meantime because you've you've done you've done really well. Like you didn't stay at, at I don't think you stayed at uh, 17 people, right? Like so today, how many people do you employ? Well, that's the key thing is that now we don't need nearly as many people. Right now, we probably have like 62 people, but we've actually put out two and a half to three times the sales that we did before. There was a major change to the culture. 
We use a system that was called Profiles International that was bought out by Wiley. Mm -hmm. And trying to get away from the pure disk system, we actually were looking for something that would look at the thinking style, the interest, and the behavior, not of the person, but of the position on the team, like Mm -hmm. operator, finisher, helper, because all of those have a thinking style, they have a certain interest, and they have certain behaviors. Mm -hmm. After that whole reverse engineering project on the positions of the team were done, we now then do recruitment. And when we do our recruitment, and they take the assessment, not a test, it then the system matches up between the thinking, interest, and behavior of the position to the person. Mm-hmm. The whole disk thing is a yet another thing, but this basic reverse engineering of the positions and matching people to it, we had a, a 70% turnover that we've gotten to is below five. Mm-hmm. One person took advantage of this system in a positive way to earn almost $40 an hour to build his own dog grooming business. Wow. And now people with the six hour day come in at six, leave at noon and could go to college. See, now we've had some people, not for a week, but on certain jobs that have ran over a hundred dollars an hour, Mm. which means one person is doing the work of 10, Mm. which means that if your burden rate on your, on that operation or on that revenue center is, $200 an hour, they pulled your schedule ahead by nine hours (laughs) that hour. It also means they saved you $1,800, but they rewarded themselves by taking a hundred of that for themselves. Mm. It was just patented less than 14 months ago. It's incredible. We're right now in the middle of a G beta national incubator over the next seven weeks to take it public. My goals were to have an appointment with Pixar. I already have uh, one of the connections to the chief technology officer, to Oracle, because we basically do a full payroll every 20 seconds. And with Oracle, we can do it. So to produce their living, their real-time pay rate, we basically have to do a payroll every 20 seconds. But to work with faster press operations, we need somebody like Oracle So that's another one of my goals. Mm -hmm. And then possibly like with Apple, because education is a big part of it. We believe that the technology inside of the person behind the cell phone will always be greater than the device itself. This is what I'm really curious about understanding, because obviously like any manufacturing company today, like there's this big fear, right? Like, so we understand that technology is changing at an exponential rate. You're taking advantage of that by creating this. This system would not have been possible even a few years ago. I would have said from a technological point of view, right? Like processing data at this at this speed is incredible. But you've done it in a way that the technology enhances the benefit or enhances the human being and enhances the benefit to the human being. And I'm just really curious. And I think that's the most positive way of applying, you know, technological change, of course. Obviously, it's instead of seeing it as a substitute to humans, it's an enhancement. But A lot of people fear the worst. A lot of people fear that, you know, automation is going to kill more jobs and it's going to like, you know, eventually going to substitute people altogether, especially within manufacturing. What is your view on this? And also, what have you seen in terms of your competitors who were equally hit, I'm sure, also by the recession? And how have they dealt with it and have they survived? Well, you have survive, alive and thrive. Mm -hmm. They're alive. But when you see how engaged, engagement will be the fuel of our future. Mm-hmm. And we need, to, we need to empower. We need to engage. This system is phenomenal, and it's very, very expensive to develop. I was at a seminar a few weeks back, and one of the emails from a, somebody wiser than I was that this could change the world. Because we need to have equipment complement people and complement parts where it could cause repetitive motion damage. It's very exciting actually to talk to you about this now because like, you know, we will hopefully see these things deploy over the years to come, but then you also come to obviously resistance and that resistance will probably be at the leadership level. So I was just wondering in terms of leadership qualities, what do you think leaders in manufacturing need to develop in terms of qualities in order to understand 
what you're offering here in terms of a system, what that system, how that system can benefit. What do you advise other leaders to develop in terms of their own skills in order to benefit from something like this that can retain their talent and get the best out of their talent and their people? I absolutely know that you're right because it won't work. If we actually, one of my incubator, uh, the CEO of our local incubator took me into a company and she said it wouldn't work. But I've discovered in the last few weeks, Barry Waymiller out of St. Louis employs 13,000 people. And in his book, Everybody Matters, actually one of my pitches I want to do is with them, but they have the most amazing culture that this would fit into overnight. Mm -hmm. And you are absolutely right. I need a major beta company like them, the 3 to billion, roll it out. Yeah. 3, thousand comp and for us to unite this together and show the world that it, you know, we're a small company, but if you beta into a large culture and a company that's right and ready for it, mm. it will be what will, just like the web grew, it'll actually grow out into other manufacturers. What are the next steps for you to take now? So you said you patented it, and now what is going to be the next step to roll this out nationally and hopefully internationally? Well, three weeks ago, I started in G Beta, which is a national accelerator mm. with six other companies. Now, that's where I was explaining the goal. My one goal in my two weeks already in there is set to have a, a pitch to Pixar. Mm -hmm. The second one is Oracle, which we're working on now. And then the third one would be to connect with Apple because education is always a big part. Learning is actually a big part, whether you're in school or whether you're in the workplace. So at that point in seven weeks, we do a high level pitch to Microsoft, Amazon, Pixar. We're catching it a very exciting time, Mark. It seems like and just I just I feel like I need to call you in a few weeks because I want to know what happens. <laughs> <laughs> could send you the at neo which is part of jobs ohio i presented this to 130 people a few weeks ago and i'll share with you that a, a person before me at that event had been a five-year business winner in that city mm. and he explained about using current reading technology to read the power on his machines mm. so he could watch them and see when they weren't working and then he told them that he put them on and that he was watching them. And his, his production went up 25%. But I think mm -hmm. you and I both know that that's the model where you're exploiting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see what you mean. And I had no idea what his topic was on. And what you see in my presentation after it with the videos, I think would do a huge value over what I could give in the presentation. One last question, Mark, before I let you go and change the world, because that's what you're clearly doing. So <laughs> it's like one last question. I was just wondering whether you feel like, because that must have been a big hit for you guys in 2008, right? Like emotionally and from a business perspective. Economically, oh yeah. Yeah, exactly. And morally as well, right? Like it's very yeah. tough to come out of that the other right. end and sort of be so positive and, and reinvent and disrupt basically what you're doing is possibly disruptive even to, disruptive, to a whole. Yeah. Exactly. So takes a lot of things. So now, like, you know, when the next recession comes and, you know, we could argue that, you know, it will. <laughs> do you feel more recession proof? Like, you know, now that you've been through it, like, do you look at the future and be like, yeah, we can weather stuff like that hitting us again, and it will not have the same consequences as it did before? Well, and I, that comes from next space technology. Mm -hmm. If you're not in the next space, you'll be out of space. Mm -hmm. That would be, relatively speaking to Mr. Kodak, Mr. Blockbuster. Mm. So as a visionary and a, an idea writer and, a, and a, a doer, I basically saw that we needed to be into the added manufacturing field mm -hmm. through other fibers and living fibers in my company. I sensed that. And so what we did was we actually went, joined in with YSU and we've become one of the largest commercializers of 3D sand print. Mm. And we're developing other products. I feel it's my responsibility, or at least someone in the company of the of a family owned company, to actually be the one that will look for that next space that we should be in 
mm. so that the people that we serve actually have a place to be. It's been a huge privilege for me speaking to you today, Mark. I've learned a lot from you. And I think I don't actually remember, and I've done hundreds of interviews with family businesses. I don't actually remember having heard anything uh, quite this cutting edge in a long time. So we're super excited for you. We're happy to get a, a little part in telling your story to a global audience. Thank you for listening to the Family Business Voice. Subscribe to our channels now on iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, or Spotify to be notified of our weekly episodes.